There is a sweet. everyone doing? Ah, I would like to thank everyone for coming this evening to Vision, or this afternoon, I'm sorry, to Vision. Um, I know usually when we come on Saturdays, a lot of people say they had a tough week or the week was difficult. But me, it's actually the opposite. My week was not difficult at all, actually. It was good. It was really busy. But it was like not nah, like, oh my God, like catastrophic and all those things. And then I was just wondering, like sometimes things get thrown at us during the week and we just crumble. And I'm like, why? Why don't we find? I remember for Vespers one Friday, Jenny did this um, exercise. And she said that we had to think of three things that we're good at or three good things about ourselves. And it was so crazy how hard it was for all of us to think of three good things about ourselves, but we could think of so many like negative things. Oh, I'm this, I'm that, I'm this, all the negative things, but we could not think of the good things. And it's the same thing about the week. We always think about the bad things that happen and we let them bring us down, but we never take time to really dwell on the positive and be thankful for the good things. Like for example, this morning I woke up and I saw that the sun was up. I'm grateful for that. I don't know about you guys, but 
when I see it's sunny outside, I don't know what it is, I feel energized. I'm like, I'm ready to take on the day. It's going to be a good day. Just seeing the sun outside yeah. makes me feel happy. Yeah. So as you guys go on this week, I just want you guys to try not to dwell on the negative. Sometimes something big, extraordinary might not happen, but just be thankful for the small things in life and just be thankful for them. So let us just bow our heads for a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you so much for this wonderful day. Thank you for waking us up this morning and allowing us to see a brand new day. So many people didn't get a chance to see it, Father God. As we come here to worship you, we ask that you open our hearts and open our mind. Help us to leave here not the same that we came in. Even if it's one person that is touched by the word, we want to say thank you for that. As we go into the week, Father God, help us to be positive. The devil always try to bring the negatives at us, but let us dwell on the positive and forget the negative. Be with us, Father God. Forgive all the sins that we have committed and help us to stop further sins. Be with us, guys, and protect us. In Jesus' name I do pray. Amen. Amen. I am grateful. I am grateful for the things that you have done. Yes, I'm grateful for the victories we've won. I could. So grateful just to praise you, Lord. No. Sister May Jean for this great introduction. I didn't speak with her and the Lord, the Spirit has inspired you to do such a thing. This is the moment to let us know how grateful, how grateful you are for God. You know, um, I was uh, mentioning that in the back. We're not grateful for what God has done. You know, something that happened to me uh, this week. Um, uh, my wife bought me a gift four years ago. And I looked in the book, I can get way more money than what I bought it for. So, you know, uh, you know, sometimes I know, I know, Pastor, I know. So I kept on asking her for her permission and somewhat I got it a little bit. And, you know, I just jumped, okay? So I posted it on Saturday and I got reviews. Uh, somebody said they wanted to come and see it. So he came in and then... Uh, I got way more than what I expected that what I was going to get, okay? But it's what happened afterward that really struck me, man. It really, it saddens me. So, um, as I, as we were signing up the papers, you look at the, the time that I sold it, that I, I paid it off. It fell, uh, the time, that date is exactly his birthday. He said, oh my gosh, this was meant for me. And I'm like, okay. In my mind, I'm like, who cares, man? Just give me the money and go. You know what I'm saying? And he says, you know, let me tell you my story. He said about four years ago, I was diagnosed with melanoma, cancer. And he said, but uh, it went into remission. And then two years ago, he got diagnosed with uh, uh, lymphoma, some Hodgkin, whatever, okay? Yeah, and he said, doctors only give me a year and a half to two years to live. And he's only 49 years old. And he said, so I said for the year and a half that I have left, I have, uh, I already have one of these. My wife wants one of these. I'm going to spend the, the little time that I have until the disease put me down. 
to just have fun, to just enjoy life. And I'm looking at the man. This is a man that has a death sentence on his life, but yet he said, I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to do the best that I can for the time that remains. We don't understand how grateful we are. I mean, we're not grateful for what God has done. You know, God has been so good that we do not understand. And that thing affected me because he's so young. He's almost my age. I'm a little bit old, older. Uh, but just to understand, so this is the moment that I'm sure you have a testimony other than what Majin said of what the Lord has done. You know, any little thing matter. We can go like this. It only takes a second. So any little thing that the Lord has done, now is the moment to just let us know, give your report, a praise report of what the Lord has done. Anything that the Lord has done for, for you. Yes, Majin. Um, I want to thank God for family, um, for having a family, and for actually having um, my son. So there's this um, old lady at my job. And she is, she was, well, she still is, I guess, so successful. Um, she used to work for the government. Um, she traveled all over the world. And then I remember we were having a party at the job, and she was so sad. So I went to sit well, next to her, and I'm like, why are you sad? And she said, because I see all these people, they have their family, and nobody came for me. And she was telling me her story about how she was so focused on her career that she married late. She married when she was like in her late 30s, approaching 40s. And then shortly after she got married, her husband passed away. So she never had any chance to have any kids or to have family. So she's like, oh, I just want to pass away because when I see these things happening, nobody is here for me. I don't have a, I don't have a son. I don't have a daughter. I don't have, because she's the only child. So she's like, I don't even have a sister or a brother to come see me. And I'm like, wow. When she was telling me that, I feel so bad for her. And I'm like, I'm grateful. Even though my son came into my life at a low point, I'm grateful that he's still here because I still have him. And I'm also grateful for my family because even though, you know, families have their faults, nobody's perfect, but I'm happy that they're in my life and I have family because that little lady, she didn't have anyone. So I just want to thank God for that. Amen. Amen. Anybody else? Anybody else that has? Yes. Oh, Pastor? Oh, okay. Who? Oh. Diane. I'm thankful. I'm very thankful. Um, I have three sisters, and they all decided to move to Florida. And we're a very close family where we we like we used to like to get together on any holidays or just get together because we wanted to get together. And our families grew, like all of our families grew and everything. And I could not believe that eight years passed. Eight years passed so fast like that. And I didn't get to see my sisters. So one day I was talking out loud and just telling Bernard, man, I wish I could go and see my sisters. But because of COVID and everything, you know, it's, it's hard. But thank the good Lord. God is so good, and I'm, I am so grateful. Um, last week, and I, we went, and I saw my sisters. And I could fellowship with them um, and, you know, talk about God and all the things that are happening that's similar to everything that's happening here. So it's like, it was great to see my sisters. Amen. It's going to be short. I want to thank God um, for prayer. Yes. Um, prayer heals. The, the time that we are living now, it's, um, it's very tough. Um, left and right, we go to Facebook, and it's, it's basically um, obituary. Um, people are dying left and right, and people are posting their loved one dying. But the power of prayer is that um, it heals. And we, still, we need to pray for each other. We need to pray because this world that we're living in now, it's getting worse than what it used to be that we used to know. Um, I have a friend that 
a couple of weeks ago, she, she, um, she had issues, went to the hospital, straight to the ICU. And it didn't look good. But to the, prayer, to the power of prayer and people praying, um, I got a chance to talk to her via, um, what is it, FaceTime. <laughs> and she's not 100%, but she's getting, she's better. Still the ICU, but she's better because once you go, okay, once you go to the ICU <laughs> nowadays, it's basically a death sen sentence, right? Because no, you don't know. It most likely the other way. But um, we want to thank God because it, um, he blessed her and her family that she's able to talk. She can talk now, and she's more. Um, she's coming around, and we want to thank God for that. Amen. 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 Yeah, I got some. Um, I gotta praise God because, like, this week, I was really, really, really angry. But, um, like, I don't know. I like felt something pushing me to go to church and to say my testimony today. Um, there was a. Uh, so I'm in school, and I'm trying to like finish up um, what I'm trying to do and uh, it's difficult to balance like school with like regular life with things that I, with other things and um, like just school in general is really hard but um, and uh, with work like it was hard to balance the two and um, I found myself like I need to go to work because I got bills and um, my brother and I we work at the same place and uh, <clears throat> we, we both got let go from that site because we both weren't in uniform. So uh, like we got let go and uh, when I received a phone call, I was coming back from the site that I was working at. So I was like, oh man, like I'm really like, I really like, oh man. So I, I prayed immediately because like whenever like I have a, like, whenever stress goes up in my head, like, my immediate uh, thing is, like, prayer. So I pray, and I'm like, what am I going to pray? Am I going to get mad at God because, like, I wasn't wearing my uniform? Like, what am I going to do? So um, I remembered somebody that got stuff taken away from them, and uh, that was Job. And Job said, God, you give, you take away. But Job was guiltless, so, like, I was guilty because I didn't wear the uniform. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to say the same thing. God... You give and you take away. So two hours later, I received a call from my boss, and he put me at a different site where originally I was working four days a week, 10-hour uh, shifts, um, earning the amount of money that I needed to in order to sustain myself. Um, now I'm working two, uh, two days, 10-hour shifts, and I'm making the same amount of money that I made before. So like, it's just incredible how God blessed me this week. Amen. And I had, to, I had to praise him for it. Amen. Hallelujah. Does double the tithes too. So amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. We're going to sing it. Is there anybody else that has something that God has done? If not, we're going to sing our song. I have faith. I am grateful for the thing that you have done. Let's just sing. I am grateful for the thing that you. I am. I am grateful for the things that you have done yes i'm grateful for the victories we've won i could go on and on and on about So grateful just to praise you, Lord. Flowing from my heart are the issues of my heart is gratefulness.
Okay, now it's time for our scripture reading. If everyone can turn their Bible to Luke 9, verse 62. Luke 9, verse 62. And it says, But Jesus said to him, No one, having put his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Amen. Pass me now to gentle savior as Bert Lee is gonna is gonna pray for us. Pass me now. come together to come together on another Sabbath day Lord God as some o- as some other people have n- did not get to see this day Lord God I ask that you please um protect us and guide us and bless the person who is going to speak today Lord and Lord I ask that you um let your words flow through their mouth so everybody who is here can be blessed with um the word that you gave them today Lord I ask that you um bless each and every one of us here um, allow us to be filled with the Holy Spirit as we leave here, so we can give, so we can give a testimony to to others in the world, so they can be prepared for your soon coming, Lord God. We, I ask you again to please bless each and every one of us in the name of Jesus. I pray, Amen. Amen. I'm singing, Savior. Say- Offertory um, to give God back what He has given you. So, just before, I just want to say a little something. So, I remember we were talking about does God still give wealth and does He still make um, make us as wealthy as He did back in the day? And me personally, I think He does. I think He does give us wealth, or I think He puts us in positions to be successful. But it is up to us what we're going to do with that success. Because right now, if you're making $600 every week or $1,000 every two weeks, and you're having trouble, you know, giving your tithe and offering, what makes you think that when you're making $10,000, you're going to be, like, let's be honest. Let's say you're making $1,000 now, right? And then you have to give 10%, which is 100. And you're like... Oh, I could do so many things with that $100. I can get gas. I have to buy this thing. 
And imagine you're making $10,000, um, I don't know, every two weeks. You're going to be like, I have to give a whole $1,000 to the church? Like, you know how many things I could do with that $1,000? So yes, God does put us in positions to be successful, but when we're in that success, we have to remember God. We have to remember to give it back to him. And you guys can give your tithe in the buckets over there, or if you're tech savvy and you're a millennial slash Generation Z like me, who never has cash, you can also do it online at Adventist Giving. And Brother Nathan has a testimony uh, <laughs> that he likes to give. <laughs> this is, first off, you the things that happened in your life, it, it's amazing to see what God does because, so I hadn't been paying my tithes and offerings for, for like the past two years, right? Since the pandemic started, I wasn't giving God anything because I was like, bro, I'm not even going to church. Like, what's the point, you know? And then uh, I was having a conversation with my mom earlier in the week. Like, it was like Sunday. She was talking about, okay, we were doing family worship. She's like, okay, you're going to sit down and you're going to give Jesus money finally. I was like, get mad. I'm about, I'm about to lose cash, right? Because... I'm, I'm already working a job. They, they, they don't give me that good of hours, and I'm trying to search around. So I gave Jesus a 10% of what I had. And, you know, my mom, she was all just like, here. She, she threw some cash. She's like, this is Jesus giving back to you. And at first I was like, wow, like, this is great, you know. So I gave, I'm not, obviously I'm not going to give the amounts, but literally this week, the first week I started paying tithes. And it's crazy because the pastor had a sermon last weekend about paying your tithes and offerings. And I'm sitting here going, get mad. I just gave Jesus my gas money. Like, oh, this is tough. Later in the week, I'm on the phone with my friend, you know, before I'm, I'm about to run all-star team up on 2K. And I get called downstairs. Or my mom, she comes up the stairs. She goes, Nene, we got money for you. And I'm like, what? You got money for me? To make a long story short, the first week I paid tithes and offering, I got back 40 times what I gave God. Exactly 40 times what I gave God earlier in the week. And it's just crazy because it's like the first time I pay tithes and offering, you know, especially us young folk, we hear it all the time, you know, pay your tithes, you'll be blessed. I'm sitting here thinking, man, like, I'm going to need a blessing soon. I'm giving my money saying, Jesus, I need a blessing soon. And within the same week, he gave me 40 times what I gave him back. So, like, that, 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 that's just my testimony on it. Like, you got, like, paying your tithes and offering is important. And especially when you give with an open heart, it's like, it makes all the more difference because it, it literally, it literally, I, that was like, an, that was what I consider an experience I had with God because times are tough. If you're a college student, you understand exactly how I feel. Like time, it's hard getting money like that. So when it comes to you in different ways, it's just crazy to see how God blesses you. So, Amen. Amen. The insurance bill is coming pretty soon, but you know what? There, there's another way. You, if you don't have money to give God, there's another way you can give God something, right? What? What can we do? We can give him praise, right? Our time and our praise, right? So this is the moment for our praise session. And again, when I praise, I praise. I don't even look at the assembly. I just sang, okay? So we're going to come. We are going to sing, oh, come, let us, let us adore him to start. If you feel it in your heart to stand up to give God praise and glory, stand up. If you want to sit, that's okay. But at this moment, this is the time that you have to give God what He deserves, which is praise and glory. Oh, come. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, come, let us adore Him. Oh, We give him all the glory. We give him all the glory. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. We give you all the glory. I cannot live without him. I cannot live without him. I 
Not be all else to me, save that thou art. And I'll sing. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Riches, riches I need not, no man's empty praise. Thou my inheritance, thou and always. Thou and thou only, first in my heart, I King of I king, I king of heaven, my victory won. May I reach heaven, joys of bright heaven's sun. Heart of my whole heart, whatever before, still be my victory. So the next song I'm going to need soprano, alto, and, and tenors. Where are the sopranos in the house? Sopranos, sopranos, sopranos. Come on. You mean you guys don't sing sopranos? Where are the sopranos in the house? Sopranos. Okay, where are the altos in the house? Alto, alto. I got two altos, three altos. Okay, tenors, tenors, tenors. We ready? All right. We're going to sing this. I want you guys to all stand up. Come on, everybody stand up. Here we go. We're going to sing with praises. We sing the praises to the king. And I'm going to want you guys to sing it with us. You, you ready? Come on. What? What? Are we having issues? Do we have another tenor? Oh, we have a bass now. Oh, that's even better. We have a bass. Okay? All right, let's go. So, where are the sopranos? Sopranos? 
sopranos, so I got sopranos, I got sopranos, so I got sopranos, altos, altos, one, two, three, altos, four, tenors, tenors, you good, right? Tenors, no, tenors, okay, all right, ready, come on, there you go, we please, we sing the praises to the king, you ready, come on, fellas, people are waiting, come on, man, let's go, come on, here we go, all right, all right, here we go, here we go, here we go. We sing, we sing. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King of Kings. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King of Kings. One more time. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King All of right. Kings. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the, the King glory. of Kings. Give Him the glory. You go. Give Him the glory, for He is the King. Give Him the glory, for He is the King of Kings. We're gonna do one again. Here we go. Everybody. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King of Kings. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King of Kings. Here we go. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King of Kings. We sing the praises to our King, for He is the King of Here we go. Give the glory, for He is the King. Give the glory, for He's the King of Kings. Give the glory, for He is the King. Give the glory, for He's the King of Kings. King Jesus. Amen, amen. And oftentimes, especially this week, I found myself uh, in complete surrender to God because he reigns. Amen.
draw me near I'm desperate for you Desperate for you I surrender Here I am. Here I am, down on my knees again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here. Find me here, Lord, as we draw me. Desperate for you. I'm, I'm desperate for you. I surrender. i 
Good afternoon, church. I want to thank God for the wonderful music. One thing I can say about this church, you cannot fall asleep during praise time. You cannot fall asleep during praise time. This morning, I want to talk to you about a message I entitled, Don't Turn Around. Let's bow our heads for a word. Loving Savior, which are in heaven. Father, we just want to thank you this morning for the opportunity to be able to praise your name. We want to thank you because you have put breath in our nostrils. You have given us the voice so that we can praise you and give glory to you. And Father, we thank you again for the opportunity. Father, we pray that you have blessed us to be here. And Father, we pray as you are about to present your message, your word to us, may you help us Lord, so our minds will be able to absorb your message. I pray, Lord, that you'll hide me behind the shadow of your cross so that the words that I'll speak will not be my words, but will be your words. And your people will receive a blessing from it, I pray. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Don't turn around. Now, because of the Jewish culture, which is highly patriarchal, most powerful women in the history of mankind went unnamed. They did not get the recognition they deserve. For instance, who in here knows the, the wife of Noah? The name of the wife of Noah. Or the name of the wives of Noah's sons. Now, you must admit that after the flood, only eight souls survived. And it is because of those eight people that we are here today. So they played a very essential role in repopulating mankind. Yet still those women went unnamed. They are just known as Noah's wife and Noah's son's wife. There is another woman, we find her story in Genesis chapter 19, that also went unnamed. In fact, the Jewish tradition, in the Jewish tradition, they call her Edu or Edith. But the Bible is silent about her name. Yet still, Christ told us in Luke chapter 17 and verse 32, to remember Lot's wife. Who was Lot's wife? In fact, if we want to go back and, and introduce Lot's wife, we have to introduce Lot. I, I don't know if you, if you grew up in that time because when I was growing up, there were people, that women that I only knew their names, I, well, I only knew their husband's name. And every time we address them, we'll call them mistress so-and-so. And I lived my entire life not knowing their own name. And this was the situation in those days. This. Lot was the nephew of Abraham. 
Now, Lot's father's name was Heron, and Heron died very young, so Abraham and his father took Lot underneath their wings, and everywhere they went, Lot went with them. In fact, when they went to Heron and settled there, Lot was with them. The biggest story we get about Lot is when they got to uh, the, the plain of Canaan, where Lot and Abraham servants were, were having disputes because they were living in close quarters and they had so much riches that they could not survive in the same area. So, so Abraham told Lot to, to, to go and, and choose wherever you want. And if you go left, I will go right. And if you go right, I will go left. If you go up, I will go down. And Lot and his wife chose to go towards Sodom. In fact, they settled in the land of Sodom. Very early in Genesis chapter 13, in fact, the Bible told us when Lot and his wife decided to settle in, in, in Sodom that Sodom was a wicked and sinful city. So that was known even before Lot and his wife decided to settle there. You know, sometimes we are attracted uh, to city life because it's convenient. Sometimes we are attracted to city life because it's exciting. In fact, some people will not want to come and live in, in the country because there are no parties. There, 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 there's nothing going on. There, there is not all the things that we are used to. The stores are closed early. People go to bed early. People are walking on the street. You, some people don't want to live in this environment. I am not sure if that was the situation with Job's wife and Job's family, but we find Job's wife, I'm sorry, Lot's wife, not wanting to leave Sodom when it was time to leave. The Bible tells us that a few things were going on in Sodom. In Ezekiel chapter 16, verse 49 and 50, we find a some of the things that was going on in Sodom was highlighted here. Ezekiel chapter 16, 49 and 50. It says, now this was the sin of your sister Sodom. She and her daughters were arrogant. They were overfed. They were unconcerned. They did not help the poor and the needy. They were haughty. And did not, and did detestable things before me. Therefore, I did away with them, as you have seen. First of all, the Bible said that Sodom, they were arrogant, having an attitude that they were better and smarter. And more important than other people. They were overfed. Having too much. Being wasteful. While others around them were dying of insufficiency. They were unconcerned. Not being involved. Having no pity. Or interest. In the walls of their neighbors. They were high tea. They felt that they were superior. And have contempt for other people. Considering them inferior. Now I don't know if you have ever seen anything like this. In your neighborhood, in your surrounding. I don't know if you yourself feel this way. But this morning, I think this message applies to us. Luke, um, Luke 19, Luke 17, 28, 
listed a few more problems that they had. Luke 17, 28 to 33. Likewise, just as it was in the days of Lot's people, they were eating, drinking, buying, selling, planting, building. But on the day that Lot went out from Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be the same in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. You must admit that Lot's wife was living in a similar world as we are living. It appears that Lot, in their days, they had their own Wall Street. Where people were buying and selling all day. It appears that they were working, they were so involved, entangled in working. Working was so important to them that they had no time to read their Bible. They had no time to spend time with God. They were so important. They were so interested in getting rich. It appears that they were partying all day. Some of us, we work so much that we don't have time to spend with ourselves and our family. We are always busy working. To us, the most important thing that we have to do here is work. Now, maybe Lord wife had also become complacent. Sometimes as we go into the world, we, we, we sometimes we, 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 we lost our edge. We start forgetting what sin is. We start not knowing what is really right and wrong. Because sometimes when I look out there, I can clearly see what is right and what's wrong. But yet still, some of us are falling for those trees. We don't realize, we, we, like we have lost our, our head. We have, the, the spirit is no longer prompting us. I don't know if that was the condition of Lot's wife. But she reached a point where she was hesitant to live sin. This morning I want to ask you, are you ready to run away from sin? Or are you hesitant to leave those sinful behaviors, to leave those sinful acts, to leave even the sinful cities, and to serve God in sincerity and in truth? John warned us about getting too entangled in the world. In John, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 16, he writes, Do not love the world, nor the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Because all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh, the desires of the eyes, the arrogant pride of material possession, is not from the Father, but from the world. I heard a story not too long ago about a Christian friend that called the, another sister and told the sister that if you, it was during the election, so they said if you vote for so and so, God is going to come. And if you vote for so and so, he's not going to come yet. So the sister said, well, yeah, we're going to vote for so-and-so because we want God to come. She said, no, 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 we, we're going to hold on to that. We're going to hold on to that, yeah, we, we, we don't want God to come here. We, we still got to, are we ready? Are we ready to get out of this world of sin? Are we prepared? 
If Jesus should come here right now, are we ready? My brothers and my sisters, this don't happen automatically. We have to start preparing ourselves so that we can leave this world of sin. We have to start making preparation, cutting ourselves. When the Bible tells us not to be in the world, it doesn't mean not to function in the world, but not to be too attached to the things of the world. Some of us, we would die if we don't have our cell phone for one day. Because we are so attached to it. Now, I have a cell phone and I use it. But most times, I don't know why it is in my house. People call and they say, I called you. I say, okay, when I see it, I'm going to call you back. You know? I, I don't work for an emergency system. I'm not 911. You know? Whatever you're calling me for, it can wait. You know? I, I remember my, 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 during the time of my grandmother, and when I was growing up, I mean, we had to wait for days before the message went to the other place. And we survived, you know. Some of us, we, 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 cannot, you know, we, we, we cannot survive without our television programs. Very important. Some of us, we cannot survive. We cannot imagine ourselves not having a car. It's important. But I'm telling my brother and my sisters, the time might come when we might not have those things. And we need to start preparing so that we can cut ourselves, if we have to, from those things. And that doesn't mean you don't have them, but you just know that you can cut yourself from it. You use it in a way that you are not too attached to it. Because if we are too attached to the things of the world, when the time comes to detach, we will not want to leave. You know, we are living in a world where people can wake up and determine whether they want to be a man or a woman. We are living in a world where greed, selfishness, and pride is in abundance. We are living in a world that is plagued with sexual immorality. A world that seems to make everything so attractive that it is difficult for us not to get involved. Especially as young people. But I can tell you, my brothers and my sisters, a lot of those things, all they do is to push you away from God. A lot of those things, you know, internet is good. I, I use the internet all the time. But if you, you know, some of us get so addicted to the internet that we spend no time, even while the Bible is on the same phone that we are on the internet with. We have no time to read the Bible. We have no time to commune with God because we are so involved. We want to hear the next gossip. I know people that just surf in the net just looking for the new gossip. Just looking. Just checking. You know? Just checking. And every time you see them, they are swiping. I want to tell you, my brother, my sisters, this might have been the life of, of Lot's wife. She got so attached and so entangled with the things of Sodom, it was difficult for her to leave. Now, you might not get a blatant um, uh, a rescue effort like, like what happened to Job and his wife because the angels of God actually and physically got them out. But you might hear the still small voice of the Holy Spirit telling you, get out. Cut it off. Too much of that. 
too much of that. My brothers and my sisters, if we are not in tune with God, if we're not in tune with God, we are going to miss it. That's why it's very important that we constantly, constantly spend time with God. You don't have to buy a Bible anymore as long as you have a phone. I think every home in America, even the homeless have phones. So it's not even the homes now. Everybody, almost everybody in America has a phone. You know, when Christ used the, the term, the terminology, or they call it the, the um, uh, proverbial language of if he that put his hand to the plow, should not turn back. This was a language that was well known and fully understood in the Jewish culture. Because they were used to plowing. And they knew that once you start plowing, you got to continue looking straight ahead because the furrows need to be straight. So once you start plowing, you cannot look back. Jesus used the same language to tell us Once we make a commitment to him, don't look back. Don't turn around. It doesn't matter what the angels told um, Lot's wife. It doesn't matter what you hear behind you. Don't look back. There will be a lot of noise coming from behind in your life. There will be people, family, friends, Brothers, sisters, talking behind you. There will be noise, there will be earthquake, and there will be thunder. There will be death, and there will be life from behind you. But once you have made this commitment with Jesus, don't look back. Don't turn around. Don't turn around. You know, There is a powerful story in the Bible. Well, not in the Bible. There's a powerful story. It's a song. I learned this song very early in life when I was looking for God. There were the Pentecostals around. So I went to the Pentecostals and they loved to sing this song. The song. The song is written by a gentleman named Simon Macro from the Johan Assam. The lyrics of the song is based on the last days of Noxin, a Goro man from Nagha, Naghalo tribe. He and his family decided to follow Jesus in the midst of the 19th century. When the village chief heard about Their conversion, he ordered them to renounce their faith. The new convert declared, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. The chief warned them, If you continue this path, I have no choice. But to put you in front of a firing squad, those days was bow and arrows. And if you continue this path, we'll have to shoot you down. And the young man said, repeated the same thing, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. The chief men and the soldiers stood and they pulled their arrows. And they struck. They killed his two sons. And they tell him, you still can recant. He continued. The world is behind me. The cross is before me. No turning back. No turning back. Pulled the arrow again and shot his wife. And uh, and he said that, Don't no one will follow. 
I'll still press on. No turning back. No turning back. This afternoon, I want to ask you, my friends. Are you willing to press on with Jesus? No matter what is happening behind you. Are you willing to continue serving God? Even if your wife walk away. And your kids won't talk to you. And you lost your job. Are you willing to continue with Jesus? I know it's not easy. Satan has not made it easy. But it is doable. All you need to do is commit yourself to Jesus. If you are committed to Christ, Christ will be doing it through you. And he will take you all the way. I, I love this verse in, 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 in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6. It says, be confident that he that have begun a good work in you will bring it unto completion until the day of Jesus Christ. Every time I feel down and I feel out, I remind myself of this text. Because if God has brought you this far, he will see you through. This morning, the only question is, are you committed to this call? Are you willing to go all the way? Don't look back. Go all the way with Jesus. May God bless you as we continue to worship. Okay. Amen. So, um, one other thing that we, we do here. So, the question is, First of all, do you guys have any questions or any comments about this sermon? Anybody? So if you don't, um, the, 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 uh, what would you say? Okay, hold on. Pastor, you stated that um, there's a verse in the Bible that you follow or you use when you're feeling down and I out. It's in Philippians. Um, that <laughs> the truth is, it's not easy every day. We, we know that. Everybody has their ups and down, but sometimes you're down. What is it that, besides the verse, because I know I read the verse, um, how do you continue to press on? You mentioned the story about the, the man that lost his family and watched his family go down one by one. Surely that was not an easy thing. Surely his wife seeing the kids being killed was not easy. How do you press on? Well, I, I will tell you how I press on. <laughs> how I press on, I believe in Jesus. That's the first thing. I am convinced that Jesus Christ is the savior of the world. And when whatever happened. And, and you know. Uh, there are different things that you use. Like I sometimes use different verses in the Bible. To encourage me. You know I, I read the story about, about um, David. And the Bible says that David in, in 1 Kings. That David went and encouraged himself in the Lord when he was down. And sometimes that's what we need to do. So that we can continue moving encourage ourselves. And how you do that, you do that by going back and reminisce about God. Thinking of all the things that God have done for you in the past and how he have delivered you and say, man, that God is good. So sometimes you have to, you know, remind yourself of who God is and what God has been to you. Anyone else has um, anything else? So, 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 Pastor, you said, I mean, that's just you, right? I mean, that's, this is how you actually do, do, 
do it. Is there anybody that, that can give us, like, kind of kind of open it up? How do you do it when, when the tough gets going? Anyone? We all are having yes. problems. Yeah, because, I mean, I, I, I'm going to be honest with you. There, there, there are times I see dark. I mean. I can say that uh, it's not always easy. And it's like Brother Isaac just mentioned. There are some times it is dark and the weight is heavy. And you do not know what is the next step. How are you going to approach whatever you're facing? And, how, and sometimes, I don't know for other people, sometimes I don't even see that it's bright outside, that it is dark. <laughs> but, you know, um, many times I don't, have, I don't have to say much. I just said, Jesus, please save me. Amen. Jesus, I need you. Or, you know, I say, mercy, Lord, mercy. And from crying out to him, and I go back again, and this, is, this helps a lot, reminiscing what the Lord has done for you. Because many times we want so much that we don't see what the Lord, where the Lord has brought us from. All the path, all the, you know, the, the steps that he, he has walked with you. So this is how I, I, I am able to face the daily challenges. Wow. Anybody else? You know about who? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Throughout our Christian life, we are supposed, if you are able to overcome the small things, as you overcome the small things, it builds your faith. I know faith is not something that's easy. Sometimes faith is something that you cannot, see. you know, like you hear the words, it's something difficult to grasp. But as you overcome small things, uh, you, uh, you give you, you equip yourself to be able to overcome big things. One of the things about us is when we do things sometimes and things are easy, we think all of this is happening because of us. We have a great job and everything in our lives are going fine. We believe that we are the ones that are doing that. But if we take a moment and we pause and realize that every single thing that is happening in our lives is happening because of the blessings that God is giving to us. When we find ourselves in hard times, when things become tough, we can always pull on that courage. You know, because if you have had if you have gone through hard times, you have not seen this the first time, you are always able to dip in that well of faith. It doesn't matter how far down you have to go, knowing full well that, yeah, that Jesus has taken you through tough times and will surely be there for you this time. Well, what I was going to say is that not one of us will come on this planet and will not be tested. At one point in life, you will be tested. And Satan will be the tester. Even Jesus came and we saw what happened. Abraham and uh, Samson, you know, Jobs is the most popular one. So as we're going through life and hard times are coming, at one point, we need to ask ourselves, is that my test? So we need to learn how to humble ourselves on the hardship. Because if through the hardship, wolf will come. So sometimes the hardship comes just to transform us, to shape us, to elevate us and make us become a better person. So I don't wish on anybody that your son will be across the bar. I will not wish that your, your, your wife or, or anybody close to you has to face a situation like that. But I learned, and through friends I see, through people I met, and things that happened in my life, Hardship sometimes is a blessing. Wow. I can also uh, add to uh, the whole idea of, and we, we have to establish somehow a relationship with God. Because without that relationship, 
I'm telling you, we cannot survive. I, I was young, and I did hear my, what I mean by young, I'm still young, but, <laughs> but I'm saying I was a kid, and I used to see my parents praying. I used to see them fasting. I used to hear them talking about their Jesus. I had to experience it myself. And this is the same thing for everyone. You got to experience the Lord. You have to experience Jesus. And then when those dark days comes, you'll, come, you'll go back to the source of light. Because he's the only one. Men does not keep their words. They may say they'll be with you. But when God said, I will be with you, he will be with you. And as we said many times, we I, some morning I wake up, I do not see how am I going to make the day. But the Lord, since he promised he's going to be with me, I, I call on him and I said, Lord, and many times you cannot pray. Seriously? The, you know, we cannot say that we are Christian, we pray all the time. That's a lie. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, for me, I'm just saying the truth. We don't, you know, there are times you cannot pray. Yeah. But just, just one word. And, you know, and Jesus is there for you, and he will deliver you and sustain you. Amen. This, is, this is so it, true because yeah. sometimes the weight gets so heavy. You don't even know what to say. And I, I have been there. Yeah. I have been there. But you just keep on saying, Lord, Lord, help me. Lord, help me. <laughs> and you say that, that's the issue. And, and this is why it's good to have this type of conversation. Um, uh, you, uh, I'm, I'm going to speak in a minute. Um, the issue is, is that... I believe, and, and I'm so happy that we are do, doing this. I feel like a lot of us, when we go to church, it, we go to a motivational speaking. Okay? You know, like you, 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 you go in, they pump you up, and then you're like, yeah. And then you come out, you're like, and what? So I think it's, it's important to have this type of conversation. Because honestly, there are days I don't even want to pray. I don't want to pray. I, actually, you know what? There are days... You're so down. You want nothing to do with Jesus. I'm serious. And I, I know, you know, I'm, I'm probably a bigger sinner. But you want nothing to do with prayer because you're, in your mind, you're trying to fix it any other way because you don't see any way. And, and that's why it is important for you, for you guys to talk about how do you deal with it. I'm, I'm sorry. All right. I didn't want to say anything, but uh, listening to these testimonies, I said I need to share mine. And I was going um, to some tough situation this week, and while my family were praying, and then my dad started a prayer, and then we were praying together, and then I couldn't find myself in the prayer. And then after that, the prayer was done, and then I, we, we were done. And I came back in my room, and my mom started another prayer. I'm like, please, I took prayer, sir, you know? Why all these prayers? I wouldn't, I didn't want to pray because I, th I think that prayer was not the, you know, the solution. But after, in the, in, in the morning, and then I was thinking that I need to say something to God because this is not, this is impossible. And then the only thing that came in my mind in order to, say, um, to express myself was to blame God. And I was like, why me? And God, why you put me in this situation. I was blaming God. I was not praying. I was blaming God. And while I was blaming God, I was asking, I mean, the spirit to put in my mind, in my mouth, a song that other people can blame God like I was doing it. Like other people in my situation can find themselves in this song. And while I was doing that, that was so, so shocking that I was working and the Holy Spirit gave me a song to glorify God and to yeah. say how God is great. And yeah. I was like, no, this is not what I want. I was forcing myself to write another song. And he put in my mind a song so powerful that I cannot imagine I wrote that song. Amen. And I want to um, thank God for that. Amen. Amen. You, you know, another thing that's very important when we are going through those things is commuter prayer. When people are praying for you. Because sometimes you can't pray for yourself, but other people will be praying for you. You always have to try to get involved in communion. When I talk to all my friends, I always tell them, if my enemy tell me they're praying for me, I say, pray on, sister. Yes. Keep on praying. Anybody that want to pray for me, pray for me, because I love it. Because sometimes things are so rough. You cannot even face God, but someone else is praying for you. Um, I always like to bring this to the level of the young kids. Um, the younger population. You guys, 
growing up, I grew up in a Christian household, and I could remember when my family, and, and much like I do to my kids now at night, let's come worship. And sometimes you're watching your shows, or you're, in, in this case, to bring it to now, you're probably playing 2K or whatever it is that you're playing. <laughs> and um, I would get, sometimes I, I used to get so upset. Back then it was Dynasty, if you guys remember that show. And my dad would say, shut off the TV, we're going to pray. And, you know, I never understood the importance of it until I became much older. And sometimes I try to teach my kids some psalms still. I'm like, okay, we're going to learn Psalms 4 now, and we're going to learn this psalm. And sometimes they're rolling their eyes. You guys, as the sister said earlier, if you do not build a relationship, if you do not start to learn, and I call them ammunition. This is my ammunition. When you are facing these troubled times, you're going to need those. This is what you revert back to. You fall back in Psalms 46. You, so, you fall back in Psalms 121. You fall back in Psalm 91. You fall back. This is what gets us. If you don't make it a point to learn these things, read them, understand what the meaning of them are, there is no way you're going to be able to face the hardship later in life. So I always say, I, put, I start putting prayer in the bank. My uncle used to say that. Put prayer in the bank for the kids. And you guys, you need to start building your own relationship. Take it seriously. You are of age to figure out which side you're going to be on. And I just wanted to share that. Oh, one, one last. One of the things we have, you know, sometimes we say we cannot pray. You cannot pray. Like, as Christians, we don't pray. You know, you don't always have to go down on your knees and pray. You know, if something is happening to you and you say, God, how am I going to get out of this situation? That's a prayer. You're asking some direction from God. You're saying, God, help me. That's, you know, you were in a car accident, uh, not a car accident, you're, you're driving 90 miles on the highway, and somebody tried to cut you off. The, same, the first thing you say, God, help me. That's a prayer. We don't always have to go on our knees, and we don't always have to have those long prayers. God knows the intention of our hearts. We just have to call on him. Here am I, Lord. Save me. The last thing I wanted to say is I was reading Misha. I don't know how to say that in English. Michael? Micah. So, and he's saying that each nation has their own God. And me, I'm going to pray and walk according to the Lord, my, my Savior. But what I always take from this, sometimes we need to know how to pray. And sometimes you may see somebody going 20, 30, 40 days praying and nothing happened. And somebody putting his knee down for one minute and things change. Now, are you praying your God? Because each nation has their own. 